Hi, Joe. Hi there. There are already some participants here early. Oh, oh my goodness. For our practice. Um, <laughs> Can they hear us practice? Evidently, yes. <laughs> so, oh, hi, everybody. <laughs> hi. So, so far, I see Helen, Jane. I'm so glad you got in, and Joe. Um, we are having a short practice session and discussion before this, so be patient with us, please, and you'll just get to hear whatever it is we say <laughs> ahead of time. Hello. Hi, Barbara. How are you? Hi, I'm Barbara. good. How are you? Great. <laughs> I love seeing your work on the back wall. Oh, thanks. I'm also, I mean, I had it set up. Um, specifically because I teach right here as well yeah. and and this weekend I'm teaching a sculpture class and so I thought um, well you know so I've been getting ready for that and I thought well that sort of fits with what we're talking about anyway <laughs> great hi, hi how are you nice to see so, you nice to see you raise your hand if you're wearing slippers <laughs> So and we have we actually have three participants for now. Um, I don't know if they're in the waiting room or not because we didn't have that the last time. People have signed in early. They um, four panelists and four attendees. Exactly. Oh, and before I mom and Jane Sauer and Jill Norfords Clark and Joe Van Fossenhove. Wonderful. Oh, and Eric will ask to unmute. Um, and I need to make Joe the co-host now. So, okay, Joe, you're Hi, now Eric. the co-host. Yay! <laughs> um, So how is everybody? Are we ready for this? No, definitely. I don't know. Am I re I don't know. That's a good I, I, I guess we're as ready as we're ever going to be. I, and I apologize. I tried to forward the PowerPoint to you in every form I could, and it kept telling me that it wasn't going through. So you know, my guess is that it's probably, is it, if it's more than 16 megabytes, it won't. Well, I, yeah, it's like 35. I I compressed it for you and it still wouldn't go through. If it's over 16, it won't, my server won't handle it. That's okay. Um, yeah, that's fine. I don't mind. That thing really didn't change. I know. If I don't know, I mean, it's my work. I should be able to, <laughs> it's not a surprise. <laughs> if it is, we're in real trouble. <laughs> well, the only thing that was different um, was the groupings, the conversational groupings at the end. But again, it's our work, so we know. It'll be spontaneous. Yeah, which is, which is even better. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I hope that I did that based on our conversation the other night, so. Sounds great. Okay. I, yeah, I love the way you put it together, Joe. That, I know that's a lot of work, so really appreciate it. I do too, Joe. You know, I enjoyed it. I really did enjoy it a lot. So bring down my light back there. This is a brand new uh, format for me to do this, but I, I'm finding that it's pretty enjoyable. The so Zoom. Maybe more in the future. We'll see. <laughs> the Zoom thing? Uh, well, yeah. the webinar platform and, and um working with artists and talking about ideas and putting together presentations. I, I really enjoyed doing this. So of course, yeah. part of it is because you guys made it so interesting and fun. And, <laughs> and the more I get to know you, the more questions I have. So <laughs> I, might, I might throw a zinger here and there tonight. Who knows? <laughs> well, well, you have to keep things interesting. And I have a question for you. Yeah. There are no, there's nothing in the Q and A yet, but I wanted to put something and I want to, put the donation link in, whether or not people can hear what we're saying now. But it doesn't want to give me the opportunity to put something in. I could ask Robert to do it. You hear not you're not a participant, I guess, would be the reason. 
That could be, although, hi, Elizabeth. I, hi, Elizabeth. Somebody hi. told me I should be made it. <laughs> put it there. I don't know. I see open, answered, and dismissed. Um, I know, that's exactly what I see. Do you want to tell me, and I'll have him, he's in the next room, I could have him. He's a you participant. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to email you the link right now. Okay. Um, let's see. Because... Um, I think once I um, I closed my email, but I'll open it. It's a good idea just from my little limited experience. Well, I get more and more experience all the time with Zoom, but if you have your email open and it bings, it's a good idea to quit your email in my oh. opinion. Okay, I just sent it to you, okay. and maybe you can pass it on to him and ask him to just like say, you know, donate to NBO and then put the link in. Um, let's, let's judge that language up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you can, I'll, I'll say more when I introduce and when I oh, close. Okay. So you can just say donation link? Yes. Colon. Right. Yeah. Cause I, I wrote something up. So okay. this time I don't forget whatever it was. I forgot the last time. So, um, can, can I say something? One of the things that I thought I would do tonight that we did not do the other night, rather than introducing the four of you at the very beginning, I thought I would introduce each of you just before you give your presentation. If, is that okay with everybody? I think it'll make more sense to the audience if we do it that way. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. That makes sense. And it's going yeah, to be very brief. It's basically what was written in the uh, e blast that went out. Okay, okay I'm going to go tell Perfect. Rob. Hang on. Thank you. Um, all right. So I would say, you know, probably just a minute or two after five, since we already have six attendees. The last time I checked, there were 66 people signed up. Yay. Cool. Um, That's amazing. And <clears throat> I'm so excited. If somebody's hearing me in the audience, I'll hear it again. I'm just excited for people to watch what I've been watching two times over now, because I think it's terrific. <laughs> Thank you. It's been fun. <clears throat> I, love, I love this feature that um, as, as a panelist, I can actually see the attendees too, so it'll be fun for me to see if some of the people that had contacted me about wanting to come are able to make it. Plus, there'll be others too. I saw people with last names that matched Eric's and Anne's. <laughs> My mom and dad. <laughs> yes. You know, I think they can see and hear us right now. Like when I went to Robert's, computer i could see all of us i don't know anyway i could see us but he didn't hear it. but he's it when it, when i opened his chat it said host has disabled chat feature so I'll, i told him as soon as it's enabled to add no, it's, it won't, chat's not enabled it's well, intentionally not. disabled it's q a oh, oh q a okay yes sorry my my mistake so I guess people are hearing, yet yeah, chat is too distracting for the amount of people who will be around, whereas Q&A is on the side, so. So how do you see the participants who are already logged in? You don't. Oh, you can oh, really? see them if you go um, to the participants at the bottom. Yeah and you click on that, you'll get a panel on the side and then it will break it out into panelists and participants. Oh, I see. It'll be two tabs, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I guess next time I'll make sure, oh, Robert's wonderful. There it is. Um, I guess next time I'll make sure to not let people in until we're ready. I think I must have missed that Fine. You're muted, there's, Anne. There's uh, a setting that, yeah, there's a setting that says, um, 
Like yeah, I thought I had done that, but I guess I didn't. We need like a little elevator music and just I thought we were supposed to sing. Aren't we supposed to sing? I <laughs> We're in trouble. <laughs> Did you want to sing for us, Elizabeth? No, no, I don't want to sing. I'm, I haven't had any liquor tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. How many minutes do you want us to go for our introductory remarks? Um, five, please. No more than five, right? Okay. Yeah. That's, and that's what I had written down, but I wasn't shorter sure. Shorter if possible. Yeah, shorter if possible. Um, and then you can really get into your discussion. Mm -hmm. Oh. So you're going to show our pieces while we do our introductory remarks? Or how's that work? Um, what I'm going to do is um, a, it, I'll, I'll do a general introduction, and then we'll start. Eric's going to go first. And, um, and I will start by introducing him with a very brief introduction, which is essentially the e-blast description of each of you. And then turn it over to him. And then for the next, the next person will be um, me. You, that's right. And I'll do the same thing for you. Okay. And we'll just go through it that way, okay? And um, depending on how this goes, I have a, a, some individual questions that, um, depending on time, I may ask before we move to the next person, but I may hold off and ask those questions later um, if we don't have enough comments from the audience that my questions answered, okay? So you don't want us to explain our pieces in detail. You want us just to... I think it's gonna to have to be a, a quick overall presentation that talks mostly about um the kinds of things that you're interested in your work and the kind of work that you're doing um and um with your work i think we definitely need to know that it's recycled plastic bottles and yeah. um and that you're doing assemblage as well as crocheting on the work that you're showing um so beyond that, um, the fact that you consider yourself to be an environmental artist, it, I think is an important aspect of this. And if you don't talk about that, that is going to be one of my questions to you. Okay. okay. Yeah, you'll catch the things that you wanted to know and, and ask me. Okay, good. <laughs> I spent some time doing a little bit more research on all of you today. So I learned a, a little bit more that I had um, not learned about you before. And so I'm, I'm coming equipped with, with um, some more things that I can ask depending on how the audience interacts with us, okay? Oh, you know all our secrets now, huh? I wish I knew more. <laughs> <laughs> Just browsing my curiosity. <laughs> that, arrest, that arrest didn't mean anything. <laughs> Before we begin, I want to sure. remind everybody to mute themselves in the beginning when everybody when each one of you is introducing yourself so we don't have that speaker conflict yeah okay so two minutes till show time yeah we have now 21 participants already and two questions and answers well, Joan. It's Joan. <laughs> Joan. <laughs> Hi, Joan. Oh, good. The setup and backgrounds are wonderful. Uh huh. She likes us. Eric, where's your kids? They haven't signed on yet. <laughs> All right. I just sent her. I sent Joan a response. <laughs> Christy Yark, raise your hand. Nellie got a new oh. anti-birding anti collar. Oh, poor thing. <laughs> How does that work? Put a bell in it. They don't like the 
bright color. Or oh, the wow. <laughs> so Eric, the, uh, the piece on your right on the wall. On my right? Uh-huh. Yeah. What is that handmade paper or what material is that? No, it's a print. Oh. It's a, it's a, it's a one-off mono print. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Oh, thank you. Yeah, my daughter mm -hmm. actually did both of them. Nice. Oh, nice. And how old is she? Uh, she is 14. Busy. She's very busy now, isn't she? <laughs> she is. Well, not as busy as real. It's funny. It's kind of half, you know, the, she, they can get all the work done in a short amount of time, and yeah. which is good for us because yesterday she wasn't that busy, so she made a cheesecake and she started knitting a sweater. <laughs> so as long as we get cheesecakes, I, I'm all for homeschooling. <laughs> And your sweater for Christmas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so here we go. It's five o'clock. And I want to welcome everybody to our second NBO Presents Members in Print 2 in Conversation, Basketry, Architecture, and the Environment. I'm Pam Morton. I'm the executive director of the National Basket Tree Organization, and we are happy and excited to have you all joining us for this second presentation from MBO Presents. Um, the moderator, who's been one of our speakers lately, while you've all heard us as we kind of warmed up, is Joe Steely. Joe was the juror for this exhibit, um, in case you didn't hear us saying the chat function is intentionally turned off. However, the Q&A section is open. We hope you'll use it during the program. Many of your questions will be answered after the discussion between the artists and Joe and will help add to the interest in the program. Um, as you can imagine, these additional programs that we're um, embarking upon have a fin financial impact on the NBO. So in the Q&A section, there is a donation link and we appreciate your donation of any amount. You may need to scroll down in order to get to the regular donation part and the zero donation lets you put in any amount you choose. Um, welcome everyone, thank you, and I am now going to hide myself and turn this program over to Joe and the four participants, um, and I'll say goodbye and sign off when we're all done. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Pam. Um, it's just a pleasure to be here. Um, I don't know if you all can see me or not, um, but I'm hoping you can because all I'm seeing on my screen is the National Basketry Organization. But um, it's been very exciting for me to be invited to do this panel discussion this evening uh, when I was approached to um, think about doing this webinar, I was asked to think, consider some of the artists that were in the uh, Members in Print 2 show. And so I started thumbing through the magazine and um, there's so many wonderful works there. But as I began to do research, I came up with a theme uh, with the four artists that are with us this evening on um, architecture and the environment which I thought would be a very interesting topic. So without further ado, I want to introduce our panel for this evening. And it's just taking me a second here to get this started, but um, one moment here. So um, the four artists that are going to be speaking tonight are Ann Coddington, Anne, are you available? And raise your hand, and I think everybody can see you. Barbara DePiro, Eric Stark, and Elizabeth Runyon. And of course, here I am, your moderator. And uh, the way that we're going to do this, each of the panelists are going to do a very brief presentation about their work. And then we'll open it up for discussion and your questions and answers. Uh, uh, one of the things that I'm excited about is that all four panelists come from different parts of the country. Eric comes from Portland, Maine, 
And um, he is an architect, a teacher, and a basket maker. He enjoys working with a wide variety of materials, including black ash, white oak, reed, willow, paper, and chenille stems. He firmly believes in discovery through making. His craft has introduced him to the community of makers that he loves. And one of the um, interesting things that I read about Eric is that his students believe that when they come out of his class and they see the world differently, that it's been a good day. So Eric, take it away. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, yes, I, I, I'm, an, I'm an architect. I'm a professor of architecture. And I'm also happy to say that uh, I have the pleasure of making baskets. Uh, as an architect, uh, I think I can sort of connect um, you know, the, the work here, architecture and, and basketry in, in, in some ways. Uh, basketry is, is like architecture, but it's also not like architecture. It's kind of wonderful in that you don't have to deal with codes. You don't have to deal with zoning. You don't have to deal with budgets. You don't have to deal with clients. And that way it's very freeing. Um, but you can see in this slide here, um, these are rib baskets. Uh, for those of us who weave, we understand this very well. And in the way uh, we create this basket, the ribs act like the structure of a building. Um, and unlike other baskets where the uprights and the weavers might come together at the same time, in a rib basket, you're actually putting that structure first. You create the form much like you would the uh, two by fours that build a house or the steel structure that builds a high rise. We see that structure fir first and then around that structure, uh, we clad it in some way in architecture. And in this case, in basketry, we're actually weaving uh, whatever the materials happen to be in and out of that structure. Um, and it's one reason I think I'm drawn to basketry is because of that element and how it's connected. Uh, you could go to the next slide. Um, the other thing, uh, another aspect um, of the, uh, you go ahead and go to the next slide, Joe. Um, another thing that, um, uh, in another way, basketry is, um, whoops, that's too far, I think. Go back one and go back. Is there one more before that? Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah. So the, another way that the basketry is like structure, I mean, is like architecture, um, is in its use of space. Um, obviously a basket, um, and we'll see many things here that are not necessarily meant to be or in any way functional as we think of baskets, but a basket in its pure form has a space. It holds something, it does something. Um, and it has a very specific function. And that space is fundamental uh, to the basket itself. We like to say when we're teaching architecture um, that we don't design space, but we define space. Um, and the same thing is true in any sort of basket. Um, it is uh, the base, the sides, the rim that is defining some sort of space with some sort of function, much like we'd have a program uh, in an architectural piece. So this basket, which is a, 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 rel a rel relatively straightforward a round reed fruit basket is meant for that. It has a certain shape uh, that, that works with its function. Um, and I find defining and working with that, uh, that the creation of that space in incredibly rewarding. Uh, you go to the next one. Um, once we understand that there's a structure to the basket, and once we understand that we can clad that structure, um, then it really begs the question, how are you going to clad it? How are you going to decorate it in a sense? Um, and that's to me in the same way that we often talk in, in, about architecture, the difference between building and architecture, um, in that a, a building keeps you warm, it keeps you safe, it keeps you dry. Um, but architecture actually lifts you up. There's something, on, something special about it, um, whether it's the Gothic art, arch of a church um, or uh, some other aspect. And so we start to see in this one, which is a black ash basket, the pattern of it uh, starts to go beyond just cladding the structure, but starts to, in this case, uh, uh, what I was trying to do was tell a story. Um, so it's this sort of a play on an octafoil uh, that has a series of mountains and these little floating things uh, depending, I think of them as stars. My son thinks of them as UFOs. Um, you could go to the next one. But this basket then also contains a space. It has a form. Um, then that idea of cladding, this is my most recent work, which is painted plated paper, uh, a mouthful. Um, and this really, I think for me is very special because it really is, uh, as Joe mentioned, that idea of discovery through making. Um, so I was getting into more color, starting to weave with paper, and these little triangles, I call them beaks, these little spiky pieces were really just, they were discovered as I was weaving. I was saying, what can I do with bent paper? How do I do this? 
um, I discovered these pieces of paper and the way of folding them. And within that, I uh, started to really push uh, what that could be. You could go to the next slide. Um, and in doing so, um, I started to create this pattern of these beaks. Um, so in this piece, which I call green scales, uh, you see more of those in a, in a direction, sort of in a direction. So there's sort of a flow to this piece, um, I hope. And then I really love the view from above because it looks sort of like the maw of something that's going to eat you. Um, and thereby sort of challenges and talks about a different sort of space. We still have that. We have a kind of structure. We have a space. We have cladding. We have decoration. All those things are starting to come together in these individual pieces. Um, and I think in, in my work, you'll see there's, they're very much objects. And I think you'll see some more environmental stuff in the other works. Um, you go to the next slide. Um, and then these pieces, which I, I won't say too much about because we're going to talk a little bit, I think, later about them. But where I found this work, uh, I find this work interesting, and this is made with chenille stems, um, is that it's an aggregation of parts. Um, and in that way, it is also like architecture in that the same way we look at a streetscape or a cityscape, it's an aggregation of buildings, it's an aggregation of built structures. I'm very interested in how putting a variety or, uh, of pieces together or a sim similar grouping of pieces, those parts create a greater whole. Um, so I, I think I'll leave it there and, and we can go to the next. Thanks, Eric. Um, the next artist who's going to speak is Elizabeth Runyon. And Elizabeth uh, grew up in Kentucky and moved back to Kentucky in the not too far distant past, I don't believe. And um, she uses traditional materials and techniques to create contemporary sculptural baskets. Her large playful structures suggest movement even when they are standing still. Her inspirations range from nature to spacecraft to Calder mobiles. Thanks. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be a part of this and just wanted to thank the NBO. Also encourage you to join if you're not a member. Uh, it, it's a great opportunity. It, it's lovely compatible people. I started weaving what I call normal baskets around 30 years ago in a rural class that was held monthly. Mainly I had two children 18 months apart and wanted to escape them to go out for a couple of hours. And I was thrilled that I had been in a crafty kind of family, but the minute I started working with Reed, I felt like I was home. Uh, in many ways, I feel like I'm having a discussion with the Reed. Uh, uh, I'm asking it to do things. I'm, I'm listening to what it tells me. And I, I really get into shapes. I'm also inspired by the structural aspects of a ribbed weaving that I consider an app, more of an Appalachian tradition. And around 2011, a lot of things came together for me and I was able to not work outside of the home anymore and think more about basketry. So I was inspired by large Appalachian fish baskets, mainly. I don't know if you've seen them. And I was thinking of them hanging. I was thinking of them lit. I was thinking of more curvy shapes. And that's kind of been the impetus for my work. Now I can kind of see that I, I also include a normal type of weaving in there. But the beauty to me of working with Reed is that people immediately recognize it. So you can show these pieces in any show of a personal come in or a little kid and they'll be like, oh yeah, it's a basket because it looks like a basket because it's made out of reed. But then they're like, but wait a minute, it's, it's not a basket because it's, it's not useful. So people start to question their perceptions of what a basket can be and what art can be. And does a basket have to be useful to be a basket? This is a, an especially large piece inside out, uh, about eh, seven feet long. I, I like to work big. I think it, it makes a statement. And I initially, from the beginning, found the process of weaving to just be very meditative. And there just came a point in time where I just kept going. It, it wasn't even COVID. And the pieces just got bigger and bigger. And I, I really love the way a large piece occupies space and the way a large piece can communicate through the shadows and how a, a large piece can it can be referential to itself or to a second piece and to to promote movement and to explore the space this is when the circus comes to town which is considered to be more whimsical and to recall a simpler time when 
maybe a circus would come to a small town and, and people would be excited. And the repetitive shapes echo each other. The space between becomes just as important as the actual object. And in these, I was exploring a concept of what I call pods, which are the little, little pods in there. Also, I have a musical background as by my training and I consider the space between the pieces to be like silence in music because you, you don't really have music without the opposition of silence. So I, I look at these spaces as like maybe making the sound but also observing the silence. And yes, oh, this is also a very large piece that was designed especially for a specific space and the the piece on the right is maybe seven or eight feet long it, it's really big around the mother hovers over the child the mother protects the child but the the child is also moving away and taking their own direction and next i forgot what's next oh yeah this is a really cool other view of that piece because I like my pieces to have so much movement that they can be seen from different directions and you can get a totally different opinion on it from another direction. This was just an interesting way that it was shot that I think also they're moving away, they're moving together. I, it, it's just good for showing movement. I think that was the last one, Elizabeth. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> Thanks. Any final remarks? I think I'm done. That'll do it. Oh, no, there is one more. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is a uh, two to tango that is actually in the members in print exhibit. And it, it was also an exploration of movement and exploration of repetition, kind of like a musical theme and variations, if you will, or rondo form. And the two pieces echo each other and they're constantly changing because of the way they surround each other. I love it. Thank you. Um, our next artist is Barbara DePiro from Shelton, Washington. And um, Barbara creates mixed media sculptures and installations. Uh, her observations uh, from, nat from nature have triggered a profound admiration for its brilliance, resilience, and its vulnerability. With each project, she strives to create a sense of wonder. and. Um, Barbara considers herself to be an environmental artist, and you'll see why in a moment. Barbara. Oh, thank you. Uh, this piece, Metamorphosis, is um, an example of my reuse and recreation of found materials. This is made out of recycled plastic bottles. And the entire uh, chrysalis structure, as well as the web up above, uh, the translucent plastic also uh, has a, a memory in, in the original shape of the bottle, so it in itself dictates the forms, as well as there's some interesting play of light and shadow. Because of the translucent quality, you end up with translucent shadows. Um, as Joe had indicated, I am absolutely inspired by nature, and so my choice of materials was very deliberate. And you'll see that in, in, in the additional pieces that I'll be sharing. Go ahead and move on to the next slide. Here's a, a temporary installation of that same material and a similar structure using those plastics. Uh, and again, um, this, you still get a play of light. Of course, you don't get the shadow so much when you're in nature. Um, I, I designed this in uh, segments so that I can respond to the site instead of architecture, uh, a structural building. Uh, I'm actually responding to the tree itself. And again, a very deliberate and conscious choice of materials, taking a synthetic invasive material and recreating it into an organic form to make that environmental statement. Next one, please. Did it come up? No, not yet. Hmm. I see it on my screen. Oh, there it is. Okay. So uh, there's probably just a delay. Yeah. Uh, in this case, I am responding to the architecture 
not just of the city, but the structure of the, the lamppost. And this overall piece is 15 feet high. It's, it's installed 10 feet above the ground. Uh, and it is all uh, plastic bottles and bottle caps that have been created and uh, into a mesh and wrapped onto the, onto the lamppost. Um, there were actually three of these that are installed. Uh, in, right in front of the Bellevue Art Museum a few years back. So again, even though this isn't in nature, it is outdoors, but it still has an organic feel to it um, using some very synthetic materials, of course. Mm -hmm. The next one. Roots and Vines. It is actually, uh, there's a whole series of these that I did, and obviously this is one that was installed, to a temporary installation in nature, and it is constructed out of plastic bags, tan plastic bags that have been crocheted into this vine form. The original inspiration was the invasive ivy that's gotten into our forests and strangling the trees, and so I recreated that ivy using an invasive human-made product. Uh, and, and all I should mention all of these pieces that are temporarily installed outdoors in trees, uh, they are installed gently into that tree, into the bark itself, so it doesn't cause damage to the, the structure of the tree. And I've got a, an example of, of this being installed on an interior space as well. Um, same idea, same basic structure of the vine, but it, it, individual segments as well. But instead, I'm responding to an interior space and then attaching it to, to the wall structure. And this piece, uh, this series of installations very much responds to, to the light and shadow. When I'm installing it, I, I, it, I position the lighting while I'm installing it because the shadows become a very important part to the installation, as you can see, especially with the, the, the piece on the right, the, the grouping. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about how the scale of both of these installations? Because I know that we're seeing details here and my sense is that there's a whole lot more that we're not seeing in the-, in the Sure, tree. yeah, good question, thank you. The piece that was in the tree, you're looking up it actually went up the tree about 15 feet. This series of installations, each root ball is about two foot to three foot. And then it actually was uh, scattered along a wall, would go down around a corner, and, and in some locations would actually go up onto the ceiling as well. And, and I've, I've wired the individual um, a strand so that they would hold their shape and not fall, you know, with the gravity and flatten out. So the overall installation ranges from eight feet to 15 feet, depending on the location. Many times my pieces are installed in multiple locations. And, and so building them in segments and modules allows me to respond to the different spaces in that way. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Barbara? No, I think that's about it, unless there are any questions, any more questions that you might have. Well, there, I have lots of questions, but we're going to hold <laughs> off. <laughs> Our next presenter is Anne Coddington from Champaign, Illinois. And Anne is a studio artist and a professor at Eastern Illinois University. Um, she she received her MFA from the University of Illinois in sculpture, and um, she utilizes a variety of fiber techniques, including twining and netting in her sculptural forms. Um, and you'll find that most of her work is almost human scale. Anne? Hello, hello. I'm so happy to be here. Um, thank you for the invitation. and. Thank you for letting me get out of my studio and talk to, even though I can't see you, I know you're there. Um, and I think this is the first time I've ever given a talk wearing slippers. So it's, it's a first for me. Um, so this piece is called, uh, it's a looped piece and it's called bag. And um, for obvious reasons, one of the things I love about fibers um, is that 
it has really, really ancient roots. This piece, uh, the technique looping is seen, you can see examples of that in Neolithic human beings. So thousands and thousands of years old. Um, this piece is about eight feet long and I can fit inside it as well as maybe a couple of my close friends. Um, so that's a little bit about this piece. I love, one of the things I love about fibers is the, how familiar the materials feel. So even though the viewer might not know exactly what they're looking at, they've seen, they wear clothing, they wear fibers, they see things made of crochet and knit and, and textile materials have a familiarity that, that allows the viewer kind of an entry into the work. So this is a group of heads. Um, I've been doing these kind of head-like forms for uh, a couple years now. I really, uh, I started out with a group of six heads to kind of represent my family, but then I so enjoyed working that scale and the idea of, of trying different techniques and different um, treatments on the surface to indicate almost kind of personalities. And, and I oftentimes will hang my work like these are head size and some of them are more head shaped than others and they're hung at the height as if you walked up to them. So when you walk up to this work, you're standing basically kind of face to face. Um, and that helps the viewer understand what I'm trying to talk about in the work. <clears throat> I've been doing fibers now for about, oh gosh, over a little over 30 years. I was just thinking that the other day, I learned the twining technique, which is one of the main techniques I do, I learned from Carol Shaw Sutton in about 1990. And so I'm having a big anniversary year uh, of twining. So this piece is uh, an inst a permanent installation commission piece called Taking Flight. And it was installed in this uh, architectural building, a, a student center at the par at Parkland College here in Champaign. And I wove uh, 10 original um, bird-like forms and then uh, slip cast ceramic into those so that I could uh, attain a, a flock of about 500 and not about exactly 505 birds, which was a significant number to that particular um, college. Um, one of the things I liked about doing this installation was the architect had built the space so that there were windows on the east and windows on the west side of the, the space and the ceiling was 50 foot high. And so I wanted to create a piece that literally kind of moved through the space. And so um, that's what happened. It was, it was really interesting. I was, when I was conceiving of this piece, I was standing in the space as it was being built. And uh, I was just getting ready for my proposal and I was looking up and I was saying, God, this is an enormous space. How will it really look to have these little birds, you know, and how many will I need and how, how big should I make each one of them? And, and as I'm standing there kind of figuring this out in, cause the, this was, while it was being constructed, the windows weren't up and in flew these three birds and they kind of swirled above my head and, and I, uh, and and they they look great in the space and I thought okay well this is going to work so I moved forward and it, this was one of those kind of projects that it was a real challenge for me and kind of pushed the limits of my uh, creative uh, problem solving so anyway it was a fun project to work on it took a, a couple years actually to complete. And so this piece was, is called Made and Found, and it is, a, I've done this piece a few different times with different lengths of table, but this one is a, like, like 16 feet long. And it's, I often in my studio will have a space at the end of my workbench where I have um, 
things that I've made and things that I've found. And I had an opportunity to install it in this um, space. They thought I was gonna use the walls and they said, there's this big, big old table in there, but if you don't mind, you can hang stuff on the walls and we'll just kind of ignore the table. And I went and saw this space and I thought, oh no, 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 that's gonna be, that is gonna be, be the piece. And so I hung a few lights above it and um, brought, I didn't even really, know how much stuff to bring so i just brought boxes and boxes of things i'd collected and made and um created this kind of three-dimensional collage and uh and it's really probably the most fun i have ever had installing a piece and i've, I've done it a few other times and each time it's different of course and and what's really fun to me about this work is that um it, it explores and pokes at that line between things that we find in nature and things that we make. And, and some people were, were looking at some of the objects and, said, and unable to kind of decipher if, if that was something that I had just found or had created. So, and it's really an ongoing project. I have another little installation brewing at the end of my table right now. So thank you so much and I'll leave it there. Well, um, I want to ask you a question before we move on, because um, I've known you the longest of, of the four artists that are part of this group. And uh, when I first met you, you were only using uh, wax linen and you were only twining. And um, it's been wonderful to watch how how your work has evolved throughout the years and how you began to incorporate additional materials and additional techniques. And, and I just wondered if you could talk about that briefly for everybody and sure. how that happened for you. So, yeah, I spent the first maybe 12, 15 years just doing the twine technique and, um, I was kind of just really exploring form and um, and investigating what I could do with that. The twine technique is a very solid, um, massive kind of, well, it has a lot of mass. It has a, a lot of visual weight. And I wanted to make something that was in contrast to that. So I started making open structures, net structures and looping structures in uh, that I could combine in various ways with those um, twine forms and and that then evolved into looping and crochet and random weave and all these different techniques that uh, oftentimes I use in conjunction with the twining but in a piece like this they are sort of scattered all over the table in various um, permutations um, so yeah I I'm more mixed, I, as, as time goes on, I find myself becoming more and more mixed media in my approach. And it really is sort of governed by what I'm trying to say or do with the work. Mm -hmm. It was interesting when I had the opportunity to see this piece in, in a gallery in Quincy, Illinois a, a year or two ago. And um, you, in some cases you could not tell which objects were found and which ob objects you made. And I want, I'd want i like for you to just talk about that a little bit and why that became important to you for this piece. Well, I think who doesn't go on a walk and pick something up and collect it, right? And we have this beautiful, people collect stuff. They love similarities and differences in things. And, um, you know, like several of the other artists in the group make pod forms and so of course I love pods too and and um, sometimes like one of the things that made me sort of move this direction is you can see in this image there's a rock several rocks that are woven around so um, it's both found and made and then some of the forms are just purely made and some are just purely found and um, just I, I like to gather the things and use them as inspiration. And so sometimes they, no pun intended, organically move into the work and sometimes they, um, you know, stay kind of separate. So, so you can find examples here of both, um, you know, where, the, where that line is being crossed and those things are working in consort. Thank you. 
So we're going to move into um, more of a back and forth discussion with the artists for the next few minutes. And um, one of the things that um, we wanted to do is begin to do some comparisons and contrasts among the artists and, and talk about some issues that uh, people are dealing with in sometimes in similar ways and sometimes in very different ways. So um, both Elizabeth and Eric, I discovered as I was uh, talking with them the other day, went to the conference in Kentucky last year and ended up in the same workshop. And that's how um, the two of you got to know each other. And, um, and I think that both of you have some interesting ideas about the, why you're using the materials that you're using and what role structure plays for you that you hit upon a little bit in your introduction. But I'm, I'm wondering if you two could talk about that a little bit more with us and, um, Barbara and Anne, if you have comments that you want to chime in with as well, please do. So you're going to have to unmute mute now, everybody. <laughs> What's interesting is when Eric was first talking about the structure, like the beams, that, that's really what the whole base of this basket is, just like his. I mean, this is totally based on a, a ribbed basket structure. And what's interesting in these two shots is if you can see on the right where he chose to have those two little sticks come up, that that's almost the most interesting part of the basket to me. <laughs> and th that would be what I would have longer and that's what really creates these spirals, which is kind of an interesting thing. Because how, why did you choose to leave those that short or not cut them or not, what, why like that? Um, it's it's actually uh, the the ba this basket is actually a, a a kind of maquette for a larger piece that's that hasn't been made that I've been thinking <laughs> about making for about three years, um, and I'm still I mean I've only been weaving for five years now it's so it's very interesting to me like when Ann talks about for 15 years I did this and then it turns into something or you know you you as Elizabeth says you know I did this for a while and then it starts to become something so I I haven't quite gotten there yet and so. I still think in terms of function, and that, I think maybe that's because I'm an architect. So those pieces in the, those things that stick up actually in the larger basket, they're meant to hold a fishing pole. So that's what this whole thing was. It was, I was trying to make a basket that had a function that I hadn't seen in a basket. So it was meant to carry fish, but also carry the pole. And so that it's, was my, one of the attempts in, in terms of doing that. It's just so wonderfully quirky though with the, the other poles at either end. And I mean, I can see where it would be a function, but the way the stick is incorporated and in, it, it just make, gives it a beauty that you wouldn't look for with a smelly fish. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really responded to the background that each of you bring to your making. And Elizabeth, when I look at your work and you talk about your background in music and you talk about theme and variation and, um, and accentuating specific notes, um, I really see that in your work. And Eric, when you talk about your background in architecture and form and function and the, the role of the, of the armature of the building um, I, I see that very much in your work. And Anne, you had a comment. I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, I was just going to say, uh, kind of riffing on that. I, I notice in these two pieces, their connection to, to tradition, but also their divergence from tradition. And if yeah. you guys could talk a little bit about that, I'd like to hear your take on that. I really just usually am trying to work out one specific problem in nearly every basket or one particular item I want to address. With this particular basket, I wanted a nice vase, but I wanted it to not be upright and I wanted it to be held by feet. So really the whole purpose behind it at the beginning was was feet. And it's called tipsy. So it it's just meant to be a little bit off balance and like it's almost a vase, but it's not. So it, it was kind of playing with the traditional structure of a vase to make it be something a little more fun. 
Yeah, and I, I think from in in a lot of my work, it's really about, as I said before, sort of through the act of making, and it's all about iteration. If you ask my students to sum up what I teach them, I most they would say they would just say iteration. That's what they would say, and I'm very proud that they understand that um, because that's my response to them most of the time is when they're like, "What should I do?" I was like, "You should make another. You should do it again. That's what you should do. Just do it again. Do it again. Do it again. You'll learn through that process." Um, and so. This is, you know, one of those iterations. Um, there are things that come before that and things that hopefully come after it. Um, and in that exploration, um, things, uh, you know, things are discovered. Certainly not what you're looking at here was, you know, I, I, certain elements of it are planned and then certain elements are not. Um, and I just really enjoy the discovery, that, that sort of freedom, which is one reason I enjoy this. I mean, I enjoy architecture, of course, but it's it's really hard to do that if you're spending you know a half a million dollars five million dollars on a building to just experiment let's see what happens you, you don't get to do that um and you're encumbered by so many other things as i mentioned um and so there's there's a freedom to this and an exploration um that to me just and I, i'm guessing you're all the same as soon as you make something how can you not have 20 other ideas that you want, oh, and I want to do this, and I want to do this, and I want to do this. I think it's one reason why I still can't decide what material I want to work in. Um, because as soon as I try something new, I'm like, oh, there's a hundred things I want to do with that material. Mm -hmm. And then there's something else. So I think there's just a really, I just really enjoy that, the working with the material hands-on and seeing what it wants to do, trying to perhaps force it into a little bit what I want to do. And it just leads to new ideas. Mm -hmm. Great. We're going to move on. We could keep talking about this I know but we've got some other thoughts we wanted to share with you all. Um, Barbara you're using a lot of recycled materials uh, you're also dealing with technology and I'd like for you to talk a little bit about this piece and then Anne I, I know that you um, are kind of anti-technology are are thinking in terms of ancient technologies and wanting to really highlight that in your work and so I, I thought we thought it would be interesting to talk about that a little bit in the way that you're similar and different. And, and true with this, this piece, this is another translation of metamorphosis that's been mounted onto a wall. And um, it actually, this is a, a still shot of a, a video projection so there was a technique used um, on this called digital mapping, which was basically masking out everything but the sculpture. And, and then the video projection is only on the sculpture itself. And so it was undulating colors and, and patterns that were happening. And it was, um, you know, it would just cycle through and then repeat, it was on a loop. Uh, and I, I love the idea. And again, I, you know, earlier I had talked about the, this plastic material and the way it responds to light and shadow. Well, in, in my exploration of the material, I thought, hmm, I've backlit it. I've projected colored light onto it. And then I, in this case, I collaborated with an artist um, that had the skill set to, to do this. And it was it was a very interesting twist, and it's something that I, I definitely want to explore more. Um, and now, one thing I should mention too, talking about techniques and, and how you handmade techniques. Uh, this, I because I have also have a fiber background. These individual ovals were, in my mind, stitched together. They were stitched together with an industrial tool, staples, uh, and rivets. But I still think about that in creating it, thinking of it as handmade. And so it's kind of a blend of both in a way, but very strange materials for, for stitching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would love to see the video of that. I like, do have it on, on my YouTube channel and I posted it on my, on my social media. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. For a while, I, I do kind of woo, go the opposite direction. I mean, I... I sometimes teach technology, so in a way I embrace it. But in my work, I remember there was a time that I was thinking about the idea of breaking art making down into its most basic elemental moment, like just tying two pieces of string together. That when I started netting, that was one of the things I was thinking about. How could you take art making 
you know, as a kind of like Joe was saying, kind of counteract all this technology and in this digital world and where everything is simulated and and at, at a remove at that, how, how could I take what I was doing and make it the most basic elemental creative moment? And so that's when I started doing all these net nets and netting. Um, so yeah, I, I guess uh, the, I, I embrace, I'm kind of trying to embrace the, these ancient technologies, these first technologies and um, reinterpret those through a modern lens, a contemporary kind of sculptural lens. The other thing that I really enjoyed hearing about was your, your piece with the bird structures and that you created the initial, what was it, 10, 10 bird forms and then you cast the rest of them. So in a way, I mean, it was a, it, it, that was an interesting translation of your basketry forms. I really like that idea and so that you could install it in a, permanently in a public setting. That was ingenious. Yeah, well, thank you. I, you know, it was kind of an invention. Out, you, you know how it art, being an artist is. It's invention out of necessity, right? <laughs> so I needed over 500. They, they, their um, district number was 505, and it was this giant space. So oh. that's how I came up with that that number. And but there's no. It would have taken way too long to weave 505 of them. And so it's like, what could I make them out of? And so I taught. I had a friend, uh, one of my grad students helped teach me how do you slip cast and let's figure this out. So um, yeah, but I, I also really liked the sort of ancient qualities of working with clay as well. And I just think it's both, it's interesting in that and in the same way Barbara's work takes a milk bottle and, you know, puts, just flips it on its head, if you will. Um, but th the birds are the same way that that idea of you, you go through a process and it becomes something very other, uh, which is at a, when you talk about getting to the basics of art, but certainly the basis of basket making, that's exactly what we do, right? You take something that has no structure whatsoever. It's completely useless as a piece of flip, you know, a piece of reed or whatever it is. And by you, you basically alter it as you start to connect it with other things. And so I like that idea of altering it, whether it's changing a material so we look at it differently or in, in this series of heads, just that idea of coming at it again and again and again through different materials and sort of altering our perception of what it means to you know, engage in a person, have a conversation with a person. Um, I just find that really interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love how Barbara, how you, um, you know, I've seen a lot of recycled art um, and sometimes it's not very far from where it started. It still sort of looks, like a bottle or whatever. But when I look at your work, I don't immediately think at all. You've really transformed and transcended the material in a way that I appreciate very much. Um, yeah. like, Thanks, that was actually a goal of mine to, to translate it in a way that people did not know it was recycled until they got up close. So they were appreciating it for the aesthetic value or for the, um, the uh, content or the um, concept of the piece. And then once they looked at it and really examined it, then it all just sort of clicked. Mm -hmm. When I initially when I, saw the oh, uh, image of some of this work, I thought you, you were um, recreating a, a beehive, and the hex hexagonal element of the beehive, mm -hmm. in the same way that Eric is plating hit the paper and, and create, and, in that diagonal plating, there's that sense of beehive uh, hexagon as well. And I thought that was really interesting and, and not understanding what the material was initially it, at all. So I think you have really transformed this and um, uh, made, it, made it seem like it's almost otherworldly somehow. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know, of course, collecting pods as well as hives and, 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 you know, whenever working on a new piece, then I go down that rabbit hole of research and discover, it's like, oh, there's external hives and look at this structure of these and, you know, slicing into them, you know, views of that. And it just, 
so many ideas come from that. And, um, and of course, working with the plastics, especially for these large scale pieces, it enables me to go large. Um, but again, you know, I love experimenting with other materials as we were talking earlier. It's like that idea, that structure, what would happen if I did that out of paper? Sure. Or what if I make it out of plastic, or not plastic, but out of fabric? And so I love that back and forth that comes from just exploring the ideas, exploring the forms, using different materials. Do you really get lost when you go to like the grocery though? Because you might be looking at all these other bottles and containers and you know, you'd be like obsessed with I want that, I want that. <laughs> what you could do with them. It, it would be really hard <laughs> to well, shop. You know, and I have to say everything that I use and I was, I was adam, adamant about this using post-consumer. So I had a relationship with local recyclers. I'm not a big consumer. Right. I don't use a lot of plastic. So the majority of what I used was not from my world. Um, and you know, at some point we might talk about how COVID is affecting our art, but it definitely, I am, I am not gonna be digging into other people's garbage uh, in the near future. So this ability to translate my ideas into other materials that are safer to handle, I'm thankful for that. <laughs> so we're going to move on. But one thing I wanted to say uh, that, that I think you all have brought out really eloquently is that being an artist is about being curious. It's about asking that question, what if? and being inspired by that curiosity and, and aware of what's, what's in our everyday environment and how can I reinterpret that? I think that, that's, that seems to be a commonality that um, all of us have. And so he, there's a couple of other things that um, I, I wanted to ask about um, before we turn it over to the audience questions. And I think that um, every one of you is using repetition and specific methods to accomplish um, repetition in your work, but each of you is doing it in a very different way. Uh, Barbara, in this particular example, it's, it's a very regular repetitious shape and line coming out of it. Um, in Anne's, you're, you have similar kinds of, of forms, all with made out of different materials. Some are more solid, some are more um, um, open, but, but that grouping is, is what's creating um, the power in the image in the same way that the repetition in, this, in, in Barbara's is doing in a more regular way. And then Eric's, you're doing a repetition in creating these various related forms and joining them to create greater impact. And then Elizabeth, in, in your scale and the way that you're utilizing positive and negative space, and, um, and the way that those elements interact with one another within the environment, um, I think that there's something there that each of you are doing, whether you're working out in nature or working in the gallery, that context and, and how you are using that repetition is really informing and creating more presence in your work. So I was wondering if you could each comment briefly on that and how you think about that within your own work. Barbara, why don't you start? And, and um, when I'm working on, on a piece because of the scale of my installations, I have to collect a huge quantity. I mean, literally hundreds of bottle caps to be able to create this series of three um, lamp post installations. And in the process of collecting, I may have a general idea of what I'm wanting to do but it's not till I start playing with the materials and, and through that process, having the, the multiples and figuring out ways to connect them and you know, responding to how they behave when they're connected had played an integral part in, in the design of this piece as well as the majority of my pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, and then patterns emerge, forms emerge in that process of play and exploration. And, oh, and one other thing, the method of connection, 
because they, everything has to be mechanically connected. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes the method of connection became, becomes a, a, a design element. As in this case, these are cable ties. And I thought I could have clipped them. But before I did that, I thought, oh, I like that spray of that pattern in the form as well. So that becomes a part of it. And to me, that's one of the interesting things when you start to, it's, an in, it's a really interesting series of pictures here. But I think what, one of the interesting things I really like about weaving in general, and, and I think you touched on it here, Barbara, when you're talking about, you know, you're, just, you're connecting these things, all of a sudden it becomes part of the piece. Um, I, one of the things I've learned through basket weaving is, and I firmly believe this, is you can do anything. And if you do it enough times, it becomes beautiful. I really mean that. I don't care what it is. I don't know. If you, I think we all, the basket makers are listening. You, you've started a piece of work and you get a few and you're like, this is awful. This is just awful. I should just, and if you just keep going, if you just keep going, it all of a sudden becomes beautiful. Even if you're, even if it's just the same mistake over and over again. Um, and I love the fact that, that the act of making there became part of the piece. You know, I have to connect these things, the necessity you spoke of, and then it becomes more than just necessity. It actually, it grows out of that. So for me, the aggregation, um, it just starts to look at how that repetition starts working at another scale. Like in the, in the, in the barnacle looking things that I made here, there's obviously a repetition within each piece, but to me, it's much more interesting when you start to play on that and the repetition grows. And ideally, I mean, I, I would love to see a hundred of those, you know, when I start to see these other things. Um, and then I find it really compelling to look at Anne's work because in and of itself, it's, yeah, it's repeated, but it's totally not, you know? And it's just in the conversation of bringing the group together that you're like, oh, of course, they all go together. Look at that, uh, you know? And, and to me, that's just such a fabulous discovery. <clears throat> It's also well, the way to look. It's also the way to look at it. I mean, maybe you're making something and you think it's ugly. Look at it in another way. Turn it over. Uh, look at it from a distance. Hang it from the ceiling. Uh, try to play with it more and and see what happens. But I wanted to at least mention, as far as Anne's, the uh, other piece made and found after we had looked at that the other night. I thought of it, it, when I looked at it again, and it just totally hit me like a city laid out on the table, just mm -hmm. total, the streets, the city, the way, the way a city would grow in, a, in like a way that's no planning and, and it just, and yet that's what made it so beautiful is the differences. It, it, it just struck me I like, a, like a street scene. I love that idea. I'm going to think about that next time I put one together. <laughs> That's really good. So, yeah, I mean, for mine, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, okay, yeah. for mine, um, so sometimes I'm making what I think of as, oh, this is my real work. And then sometimes I'm just playing and I'm making these little sort of samples. So, um, and then I just hang things on my wall as I'm making and just to kind of get them out of the way and kind of back up and look at them. And what happened with this particular, this is called dozen grouping. And what happened with this particular group is um, I just started noticing this relationship between these things that I had stuck up on the wall. And, and this has also sort of evolved into a longer project. So, um, and they're all about, you know, the size of a cantaloupe or so, roughly, a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, but, you know, they're about that size. And I was kind of trying to think of um, how they converse with one another, how, and as an individual thing, it might mean something, but when in context with these other objects, they start uh, having a dialogue that, um, deepens and broadens and informs the other things that you're seeing. So I now I have maybe, I don't know, way more than a dozen, probably 30 or 40 pieces that are about that size. So, and it, I love having work that you can just keep making, keep adding to, right? It, so if you're in the middle of real work, you can just sort of kind of generate new ideas by, um, playing. I don't know. I keep the, the longer I'm in this art making thing, the more I'm sort of reverting to a, a spirit of play, which is, mm -hmm. I'm going to keep, I'm going to go with that. I think. It's the goal. It's, it's the goal. 
and it's it's so nice to have them around you too i do the same thing i have all these things that surround me i worked in a bigger space in my other house but in this house it's small it's in the laundry room and it had been painted orange which is really an awesome color and so everything you put up on the wall starts to become an installation you know it's like a performance <laughs> piece you know the whole studio so the, the other thing that i wanted to tease out of our conversation is the role scale plays in your work um we have eric who's who is a professional architect and deals with very large permanent structures and talk and then begins to talk about his work which is much smaller as his way to really explore some of the notions that are in architecture that he's not able to play with and um and then and you have the melon sized pieces and smaller pieces but but m quite often your work is human scale or you you put the smaller pieces together to create a human scale um, and Elizabeth, your work is larger than human scale, and quite often, Barbara, yours is larger than human scale as well. And, and so I think that this really speaks to um, concept, what you're trying to get the viewer to think, feel, take away from the work, um, and, um, and the role that our context and environment play in the way that we see that work. So I, I, could you please talk a little bit about that? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Well, one I'll thing I, I, I can um, elaborate on a little bit and, and I'm, I think I'm within within that question, answering within that question is um, my installations, yes, definitely are large scale. But at the same time, I am also working small scale. I do small studies. I too have things installed all over my home, small little pieces that are I'm, where I'm trying to puzzle through an idea. And again, I need to also live with it and, and look at it and get different perspectives. Um, and the larger installations have also spun off into smaller gallery pieces mm -hmm. that I create that are using I've experimented with the same materials on a smaller scale, as well as, as I mentioned earlier, um, translating them into different materials. And there's something that I really enjoy with that back and forth in my own work and changing scale. Um, there's something new that always comes out of that process, uh, tweaking the perspective as well as ideas have to be translated differently when you change scale as well. Elizabeth, really, we actually I, I really work yes. from sketches and and I see 3D though. I may sketch a lot and I may spend a lot of time thinking about it, but then I see it big for some reason. And a, a lot of it in music, when you're learning an instrument and you have to spend many years doing it and it's such a subtle, uh, I played strings. So, you know, the note isn't even there. You have to find it. And it, it's very particular. So I think I liked something that's, a little more spread out. So one of the questions that we have uh, from one of our participants for you, Elizabeth, um, is is all of your work uh, quite large? Or do you do smaller pieces as well? I do smaller, like Tipsy might be maybe a foot long, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't do real small. Uh, my favorite are like the large hanging pieces that would be about six or seven feet. I think they just make a better statement. And usually they're hanging in a gallery space that's large and they, they're needed to fill the space that way. They're kind of designed to, to be a statement kind of piece. Mm -hmm. Anne or Eric, do you have anything you want to add about um, context and environment and scale of the work? I'm, I'm yes and no. <laughs> 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 it, 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 the, reason I, the reason I hesitate is because we often talk about space, scale, and light when we talk about architecture. Um, and of the three, for me, scale is the one I probably deal with the least. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, so, but what I'm really interested in, in terms of context, 
Um, and you can see it in, in Barbara's work and, 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 and use the word conversation, which I think relates to all these pieces, whether it's Elizabeth, so it's two pieces moving around in conversation to each other, these sort of bent bodies dancing, um, or Barbara's conversation with this light post, um, or Anne's, which is just the conversation of these things she's played with. Um, I, I just find that, that element of it really interesting. Um, I'd have to think more about the question of scale because you know, when we talk about scale, we're really talking about us, right? I mean, that's what it comes back to. It's, it's a human scale. So it's either something you can hold in your hand and you relate to it that way, or you relate to a head, right? You were a, a part of us, or it's something, it, and it's, I'm very interested in these pieces that are out in the, it, in the wild, as it were, whether it's a, a natural environment or a uh, built environment, because then it's a, it's a very different scale. Then it's not just human and there's something, or even in Elizabeth's work that's larger than us. And, and it sort of challenges our scale and our relationship to those things because of that. Um, so I, I think it's the thing for me at some level that makes um, some of this work, and certainly when I think about basket work in particular, the thing that makes it so compelling is I actually, the thing I want the most about anything I make is to put it in somebody's hands. So they have to touch it, they have to flip it around, they turn it over and it becomes, and so at that moment, the scale is very much, uh, you know, they're part of the piece as it were in, in terms of that understanding. Um, Developing a relationship with the piece when it's in yeah. their hands. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, for me, scale, I do think about it as in relation to the human body. Like when I teach, when I've talked about sculpture to other people, like my students, uh, and in like my 3D design class, I say things are three different, there's three different sizes. There's littler than you, which is something you have control over, you have power over, and there's something about your size, that's the second size, and there's things, and that's something that where you equate yourself to that object, or there's sculptures that are bigger than you, and that you, that you could maybe reside within or that um, dominate over you. And so most of my work is actually human or slightly smaller than human. And whenever I wanna do a larger piece, my tendency is to have it be an aggregate of many smaller elements. And that's kind of what just ends up, I guess over time I notice that's kind of what happens. I guess weaving giant things is, I, I'd have to scale up my materials. I like that idea a lot, but generally scale, in terms of scale, I'm, I'm mostly operating at a human scale. Um, Eric, one of the questions that we have from the audience for you, mm -hmm. um, has your basketry impacted your architectural practice in any way? Uh, not as much as I wish it would. <laughs> um, I, I think it certainly makes me think, um, as I was talking about structure and skin, it makes me think about those things differently. Um, but I, I haven't found the client yet who will let me weave them a house. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you need to go to a third world country for that. <laughs> well, and, but that's exactly it, right? Right? No, that's exactly the point. I mean, and that's some yeah. of the, the recent research I've done is looking exactly at that where it's the woven structure is the structure. And you're exactly right. Um, so uh, no, unfortunately, it, it really, it, it might make me think about it slightly differently, um, but I haven't, uh, it, I'm, I, 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 you know, after so many years as an architect, there, there, there's certain ways those things work um, that I, I haven't been, I haven't made enough baskets, I think, to bring it back to, to that. It certainly, it has affected my teaching very much being a basket maker. And that hands on that, it is definitely affected. So that part of my professional life as a full-time professor, it's definitely had an effect how I, how I think about making, how I work with my students. It, it's had a huge effect there. Great. Um, and this is an aside, but one of my favorite books that has been inspirational for me as an artist for probably 35 years now is Primitive Architecture. It was published back in the 70s, and I still go back to that book on a regular basis, and I'm always getting inspiration from it. It's just a, a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, we have one other question for Elizabeth, Barbara, and Anne. Um, what do you use to hang your pieces? I'm just using fishing line. Uh, 
actually. They're not heavy and it holds them really well. You have to have some structural support within the the piece to to have it hang correctly, but basically fishing line. Yeah, and my in my case it varies depending on the piece. Um, part of my background, which we didn't really touch on, is I um, I was a visual designer for retail wholesale, and I've done work with architectural firms and interior design firms, and so it all started. Um, with doing display and I had done some stage set design as well and in my background. So I find that I pull from those backgrounds and I remember the tools that we used and, and the different wires and meshes. And so, so it's that sort of an engineering brain. So when I have a piece that like in this, in this case, um, this, mesh that had to be attached I, you know i have to puzzle through the actual installation the hardware that's needed for each piece uh, anything that's suspended plastic you think isn't very heavy but when you have the quantity that i have and the volume it does add weight so i end up using airplane ca cables and and i have to um you know do just a whole range of different um, techniques to get things installed so it's it's a complicated question for me because it varies from piece to piece it's interesting that you have a theater background um, because Eric also has a stage set background I discovered it in doing some reading mm -hmm. about all of you <laughs> <laughs> okay and do you want to talk about how you hang sure um, so um, like for the bird project, the taking flight project, the, that was a permanent installation. So that hung by a bra uh, braided steel, stainless steel cable that was coated. And it, it was, it, I think it'll last forever and ever. Um, but a lot of times if I'm just gonna hang something, I often will use the same exact material I made it with. So like you can see in the piece, the, the little dozen grouping here, the piece in the upper left, it's hanging by uh, the same wax linen that I um, created it out of. A lot of times I'll have strings hanging off of my work. Um, and I, for me, I want to use, I don't want to disguise the way it's hung. I, I have this idea that uh, I'm using a, a thread-like material. So if I'm going to hang it with a thread-like material, I'll just use the thing I'm using. It seems more, more closely connected to my work to do it that way. So that's kind of what I do. Okay. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? It's, it, 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 it needs to come quickly because we're drawing to an end here. If you have any other questions. There is one more there, Joe. Um, At the bottom, yeah. Oh, yeah. Is there? If you scroll yeah. down to the very bottom of the question. <laughs> I, um, huh. well, I'm not seeing I'm that. curious how each artist refers to what their medium is, sculpture, fiber, arts, etc. cetera. Okay. And in turn, what kind of artists they refer to themselves as, basket maker, fiber artist, sculptor, etc. cetera. From All Martha right. Bird. Hi, Martha. <laughs> And that's my sister also coming. <laughs> <laughs> I, I refer to myself as a, a, a sculpture and installation artist. M and mixed media is usually in there because I work in such a, a wide range of media. But it kind of depends on who the audience is as well because fiber techniques are used in my work as well as basketry. So, so when I'm creating tags for social media, it's a little bit of everything. <laughs> yeah, and I always refer to my medium, you know, it, minors, I, I haven't started combining them yet. I, I, it's so interesting for me to see this because I just hope I have a nice long life because I really want to be able to say I've been doing this for 30 years someday. I really, <laughs> So well, I I, when I was six. It would, it, yeah, it, I, have, I often regret that I it found it so late in life, but then I'm reminded, but at least you found it. Um, so it's usually just the medium it's in, and I think of myself as a basket maker when it comes to that. 
I have, I have, I'm not at the point, I have a hard time saying artist. I'm not, I can't say that quite yet. I'll, I'll get there someday. I have trouble too. I usually just say, I make crap in the laundry room. That, that's kind of my, <laughs> my thing. That's and totally act, what you would say. And <laughs> actually, early on, I was juried into a lot more contemporary art shows than I was into fiber or basketry shows. So I, I've kind of come around. I just, I'm, I call myself a basket maker also, but it, it was interesting that it was more the contemporary art people that embraced it first. A, a lot of real weird cutting edge places. So, but it's great to be in the basketry community. <laughs> Isn't it though? It is. It's wonderful. And Eric and I, I should point out, we're actually table partners at yeah. the workshop, not just in the workshop. <laughs> and we should each send out a shout to Kale, who I think has been watching. Yes, he was in it too. <laughs> so do any of you have any final comments before we end this conversation this evening? There was a comment in the question and answer to, that asked you to do stop the screen share so all of us as individuals would be highlighted. Oh, great. Okay. I don't know why I'm not getting that. There we go. Uh -huh. Can you see all of us now? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to put us so, in gallery view. <laughs> um, I want to thank all of you for agreeing to participate. I want to thank NBO for asking us to do this. I want to thank our audience for spending the time with us. We really enjoyed doing this, all of us, I think. And I hope that all of you enjoyed it as well. And Pam, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Well, I also, first, I want to thank the five of you. I know how much work and effort you put into this, and I hope everybody enjoyed it as much as I did. If you really liked it and you want to help us keep programs like this going on, the donation link is still in at the top of the Q&A section. Um, and particularly, you know, Joe, Ann, Barbara, Elizabeth, and Eric, this is our third time meeting and doing this. So we've spent a lot of time working on this, especially them and I'm just sort of in the background, um, but we're just really grateful. And hopefully we'll be doing another NBO present sometime towards the end of October. And, you know, it'll start coming out once we have the program nailed down and hopefully you'll join us for that one. So thanks everyone for coming. Um, and if the presenters want to stay on for a few more minutes, we'll just wrap this up. But thanks to all of you who came. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Amy, <laughs> Sally. That was fun. There's more questions coming in. <laughs> uh -oh. Yeah, there are. Well, um, oh, well. Let's go with the flow. Kale said this was wonderful. Great job, everyone. I really oh, enjoyed yeah. it. I learned a lot about yeah, it. It's so um, nice. And the do if, you if you go in the Q&A section, the donation link is at the very top. If you just scroll up, that's where the donation link is. Oh, we you still can, have 26 participants. You could do a Facebook post with the donor link for tomorrow yeah. saying, if you yeah. enjoyed the... <laughs> so just personally to you all, I can't thank you enough for helping NBO do this and and Joe for all the additional work you put in to pull this all together. And of course, for being the juror for the members in print too. Um, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. And we love our members. So thanks to everyone. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Oh, and Betty Kagan says, thanks so much. Great Aww. job. You are so welcome. Elaine's um, unfortunately, I'm responding to Elaine. Um, I set the last program to record and then I didn't save it to the right place. So it does not exist, but this one is being saved to the cloud. 
because I keep learning as we're working through all the technical um, items running webinars. So we're learning. Um, and I would say good night to everyone. Have a great evening wherever you are. Great. Thank you. It was wonderful working with all of you. Thank you. I'm going to make sure I get to see everybody in person after we're through COVID. So I was going to say, yeah. I think at the next conference, I'll buy the first round of drinks. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'll buy the second. Works. <laughs> I'll happily come drink with you. Awesome. <laughs> you got the third round. I got you into this. So. <laughs> All right. We got a toast okay. to you, Joe. That's Big right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Good okay. night. Good night. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.